AT Local here in Lethbridge, Local 2003. We have an office in the old provincial building on the north side. I'm past president of the local. Uh, I was president for about 15 years. And now I sit as an elder, which is, makes me very proud because I can share what knowledge I do have uh, with our membership and with the general public. Uh, today I'm going to talk about road lots people. Now, who were road lots people? What does that bring to mind? I know everybody thinks of it as people living in the road lots, like from the edge of the road up until the fence line. Well, there may be a been a few that lived that way, but that's basically not um, a road lots person. Um, that road lots means more like how wide of a lot that you would have that the government would give you. And if you were lucky, you could get a lot like along the river because uh, the river was the lifeline of the indigenous people back in the day, including the Métis. So you would like to have a lot, and, but your lot wouldn't be much wider than a city lot today. So you can imagine trying to build a house in a barn, tool shed, fields and things like that on that small width of property. Uh, some were lucky where they could get more than one family member together so they could have maybe two lots. If they were really lucky, they could get three. Uh, so, um, so what they would do is they would build like, their house on this side. They'd have their barn or stable on this side so that they could stagger them all the way up. Because the property could go back for a while, but it was only so wide. Uh, then came a time where um, Sir Johnny McDonald, he was uh, wanting to use that land that the main team were using along the river because he realized that they too could use the river for transport of goods, of uh, troops, of uh, families, especially families that had money. So nothing more than John A. McDonald like was money. So they would take them off of the off of that land, land that they had broken. Uh, taking the all the rocks out so they could have fields, uh, took out trees so they could build a house and, and, uh, and things like this. So, but then when the Europeans started to come over, they had money. And Sir John A., he wanted some nice land for them in exchange for that money. So they would come along and they would move the bay team off of that land. Um, and that's basically how the migration started from, from the east to the west. It continued all the way along, all the way up to BC coast. Uh, some went south before 9th parallel. And they're still there today, a lot of them in Idaho, uh, Montana. Um, lots of Métis there. Then Sir John A., he got the idea that he knew exactly where he could put those people so that they wouldn't be in his way for a few years anyway. So he would put them on land 
on Crown land that would eventually be used to build a bridge, get an extra rail line going. Maybe they need another road for people to travel on. So he would put them on that land. And it was the government agents that actually gave that name to the Métis, Road Allowance people, because he put them on Road Allowance land, year after year after year. So then when he wanted, when they needed land for a bridge or a railroad or whatever, then they would come and move them off the land again. And a lot of times they didn't want to go off the land. So he would bring in his troops or whoever and move them off the land. And if they didn't want to go, then they would kill them. They would murder them right on their own farms and burn the farms. And then he would sell that land that they had nurtured over maybe 10 or 15 years to the Europeans. And that went on and on, year after year after year. And they just moved on and on. Moved from one road lot site to another road lot site. And it's a pretty sad history of uh, how the VT were treated um, all of those years. And um, it wasn't until later on when Scrip came in and they gave them Scrip when they could have so many acres. And um, that they could keep. And, but it was kind of futile because a lot of the Métis people were not educated. You know, they were, they didn't, um, they didn't go to school for many years. Many of, them, many of them didn't go to school. And when they did go to school, it was maybe to grade three or four. So you can imagine the language and the words. There was no definition. There was no complete um, pronunciation of the words and things because the education just wasn't there. And um, so it took many years for them to develop um, the knowledge where they could um, tell journal, Sir John A. that they didn't want to have that anymore. And really it wasn't, the, a change didn't, came in, didn't come until they really got to Manitoba and the Red River where, where that's basically considered our homeland. And the people could come there and um, they could converse with other Métis who were educated and knowledgeable. Because like Sir John or Louis Riel, he formed the government in Manitoba. And he was a very intelligent man. So they had um, some schools in the Manitoba region. So things didn't change until after they got until they had migrated that far, like um, pretty well halfway through Ontario, you know, and, and half the way through Manitoba before things changed. But it was not um, a happy time for the Métis. It was a very dark time because, like I say, if they didn't move off that land, then there were serious consequences to the families that were on there. And um, it makes me think back to, there was a, a leader here in Lethbridge, and he remembers going down the river with his father and his grandfather. 
and hearing music. And um, they couldn't figure out what it was, so they just, his dad said, come on, let's go and see what's going on. And here was the lot put down there, and they found a BT encampment. Well, the BT saw them and invited them in to have some food, listen to the music, and, and things. So they went back there two or three nights. And uh, then the next night they went, there was nobody there. They had left. And it was because of this ingrained um, migration mode that was in their minds that we feel that they kept on moving and moving, like all the way out to the coast. Even though it wasn't, it wasn't dictated by Sir Jordi anymore. Um, but I often think back to that, that gosh, maybe there were Métis down there helping to build the bridge at one time, you know, or building the original fort. I think they, there were there to help build the original fort. And so, but that's how that migration started. And that migration was Roadmouth's people. That name given to them by uh, Sir Johnny's own uh, government agents. And they just called them Rolands people because they went from one Rolands site to another. And they were both. And um, because you can imagine if you come over and, gosh, somebody gives you land. And you're there, you can do what you want on that land. You can build your own house raise your own animals and raise crops and, and uh, things like that. And so when they had that land, they worked the land because they were like all indigenous people who are conservatives of the land. They always have been and they always will be. They're always thankful for what they've got. And they thank the Creator every day for each spring of grass that comes up, or each stalk of corn, each tree or that gives them berries, or gives them lumber to build a house, they always give thanks for that. And they always have. And so that's um, basically uh, what the rural lots people were about. Any questions? Basically, in a nutshell, that's how Rolands came, people came to be. And it's so sad because I've seen books that are published, and from page one to the last page, the language is um, something that you wouldn't believe that a whole book would be published on that. And, and it's them telling their stories about being on that, those road bumps. And um, it was really sad for me to, to read that book. And uh, so if you ever run across it, and, and it's called The Road Bumps People, and uh, it's, uh, you wonder how they even survived with so little knowledge and, and education. But they did, because they lived um, on the land, by the land, and for the land. And so... Has there ever been uh, an apology or compensation to the Métis at all from the government? No, there never has been. There never has been. And, um, and it's sad, but it's one of the ironies, you know, of our history, right? You know, um, you have leaders, you know, that uh, do a lot of good, but on the other hand, 
They do a lot of, lot of not good things. And that was the case with Sir Johnny McDonald. You know, and and I think in this last year or two, there's been evidence of that, you know, because everybody was so um, they were so outspoken about how he had behaved in the past, you know, and um, and he didn't want his monuments up and and all this kind of thing, you know. But tearing down a monument doesn't take away the the uh, hurt and the um, the validation that the Métis needed back in the day, because they did uh, so much in preparing the land, growing things on the land, and then only to be pushed off or or murdered. One of the other, and all for, and it's like today, all for the right of all ninety dollar, and that's what it came down to. And Sir Johnny, he wanted those, the dollars that the Europeans were bringing over, and he got his fair share of them, you know. And uh, so, I don't know. I don't know if there would, ever will be an apology, you know, uh, so to speak, about, about those kind of things anymore. But you never know, there's always hope. Well, thank you for your presentation. I'm sad to hear. Well, thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. It's my first time doing this, so I'm kind of hoping that it's okay and there's enough knowledge there. <laughs> Well, the music came from, really, from the Europeans, from the Irish, from the Scottish, from the, whoever. They all played music over in Europe. So when they came over and mingled with the indigenous people, uh, it was only natural that they're going to, to, um, to carry that on, you know, and to have their songs and in their own language, the Michif language, you know. Um, so, and it's one thing that has survived through all of these years um, is the music and the stories and their art, their beadwork, because the Métis were known for their beadwork. You know, they were known as the flower people. So, so I know they like the fiddle, but did they like the bagpipes too? Well, they didn't. They didn't. Um, that's a good question. I I don't recall hearing or seeing bagpipes at a function, but that doesn't mean to say that they weren't um, used. Uh, to me, there would be more like an accordion or a concertina or a harmonica that would go with the violin, yeah, or a guitar, you know, all of these things were adapted and brought over, like guitars were probably brought over from um, like Spain or Portugal and, and things like that because any of the European countries contributed to the Métis heritage. You know, they, um, whether you were Danish or English or Spanish or whatever, that would have that would have had an inherent value on the Métis history, you know. But the one thing that was true was the violin. That is one thing that did survive, and um, and they're dancing, they're jigging, you know, and. And like, and that came from like Ireland and Scotland and you know all of those countries where they where they did that. Like, um, so I know sometimes there are advertising that you know there's functions that happen. Do they happen on a regular basis where you know there's some teaching of the dancing and that kind of thing? Are there, is there a regular schedule that you have? It's not a 
regular schedule, but they do have it, they try to have it about four times a year. And uh, they usually put it on the, like, information is at the office, and they have it on, uh, like, Facebook and all those things that I'm not on. <laughs> like to have, um, at least once a year, they, they like to have a midship workshop where you can go and learn uh, midship words. And, um, and they're always very popular also. And there are other, uh, other functions, you know, like sometimes they have, um, one of the members go over like, to the Interfaith Food Bank Kitchen, and they'll teach them how to make bison stew or Big bannock, you know, and that's really cool because when you go over there and work to do that, then whatever you make that day, you can take home with you. So, so it's always fun to do that. I've got and done that myself. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's a small amount of history uh, about the Métis. What is so. the definition of a Métis person? What is the definition of a Métis person? How do you... A Métis person is a person of Indigenous and European background. Okay. And that's, uh, this, the infinity symbol is the bringing of the two cultures together. So that it, so it's never ending. Okay. And does it have to be Cree or can it... No. Okay, because... No, it can be the, any number of indigenous groups, you know, because like my grand, my grand is Cree and Soto, uh -huh. you know, so it could be um, any, it could be like... Because uh, originally they said it was just for people in the Red River area of Manitoba, you had to have either a French father or Scottish father and a Cree mother to be officially Métis. No, 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 it can be either way. It be like it, the father could be indigenous or the mother. Okay. Yeah. Because like in on my side of the family, it's through my grandmother and our, and our great grandmother that we have our indigenous background. Okay. Yeah. So it can be either or. It doesn't have to be just. But like those are all. You know interesting anecdotes that come from anybody's background, right? You know, so, but uh, yeah, it could be either or. And like, if there's no blood quantum or anything like that, you know, if you have a, an indigenous parent um, and a, a European parent, then that, that's where they develop this meaty symbol of the two cultures coming together and joining as one. So, and if your parents are Métis, then your children are Métis. And their children are Métis, so. Once you're Métis, that's it. Right, Renee? <laughs> so, are there any benefits to being registered as Métis, like for First Nations? No. Like the benefits would be um, uh, you could have, you get a harvesting permit, which means that you could harvest uh, in the province of Alberta or wherever. And uh, so that would mean that you could uh, hunt or you could fish or you could gather. It's through the whole problem. Okay. So you yeah. don't have to get a, a ticket to get a beer or something like no. that? No. And uh, the other big benefit that we have is we have um, great um, 
funds for education. We have hundreds and hundreds of students who have gone through Rupert's Land and gone, gone on to be teachers, psychologists, marine biologists, policemen, uh, whatever. Uh, we have great um, uh, strength in, uh, in dollars for education for our Métis students. Rupert's Land is the uh, name of the education sector and uh, all of the funds for education come through Rupert's Land. Um, and that's federal money or provincial? Provincial money. And like, they have like a $14 million endowment fund there. So. Um, Another thing that we have is we have Apatagosan, and that's an organization under the Métis umbrella that is for employment and employment training, like if you wanted to start a business and uh, apprenticeship uh, and that sort of thing. So is, um, it, is it a hard process to get registered as a Métis? Is it complicated? It's not complicated. You just have to fill out a form. Uh, but it does take a few months because there's such a backlog uh, that started with the COVID and it hasn't gotten any shorter. Trust me. It's kind of like going in to get the passport nowadays. You know, but it isn't complicated at all. You just fill out the application and you send it in and Gosh, I know back in the day when I sent mine in, I think in three weeks I had the card, you know. And, uh, but see, I didn't even know I was Métis until I was about 50. And then we went to uh, an anniversary, 25th anniversary in Cranbrook. I took my mother. And everybody celebrates that. And then on Sunday, you know, everybody sits around and tells lies. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, Swap stories, pardon me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we were looking at pictures and, and things like that, and, and they were saying, well, do you have your Métis card in my month? What's that? Who? Well, I didn't know a thing. And so they showed us all the history and the genealogy and everything. They all had their cards in BC, and so when I came back, I went to the Métis office and filled out the form, and there I was. And then all my sisters, they filled theirs out. Now my mother, she was a different story. Are you going to get your card, mother? No. I'm not down in the Pardon my French, but that was her words. So she wouldn't get her card, no way. And all of a sudden, you know, one day she says, you know, maybe I will get a card. So we sent in the application for her and she got her card. Whoosh. Well, every year we have an AGA, General Assembly. And what that is, is everybody comes from all over the province of Canada. And uh, there are six regions in the Métis, and so they rotate through all of the regions. So it could be in Edmonton one year, or Grand Prairie, or Wallace Calgary. Well, the first time one I took her to was in Grand Prairie. And they had a fish fry. We got there on a Friday night, and they had a fish fry out the back of the arena there. Oh, it was so good. Oh. Well, when it was over, they said that there was a talent contest in the inside. So my mother went and got a seat up in the bleacher. Well, from the first fiddle, the old toe was going like this. 
until the last fiddle was put away. So then the next day, you know, there's all these things to go to and look at, and workshops, and trade shows and things. And so that was fine. She really enjoyed it. Well, the next year, she couldn't get over it when she went there, and they're going, Oh, hi, Isabel. How are you? They couldn't get over it that they remembered her name. And they had only met her the one year, you know? And so, well, she was finished after that. She went to every AGA after that, to every workshop. So, there's a lot of pride in being Métis, just as if you're Scottish or Italian or whatever. There's that pride there that um, you belong to a family, you know. And it's interesting because almost every time you go to a function, you run across someone who you're related to. Uh, our president now, Dr. Browning, Adam Browning, he got his genealogy done by a young lad who worked at, down at the fort, and he loves doing genealogy, so he did Adam's genealogy. Come to find out that we're short-tailed cousins, because our genealogy goes back to Donald Ross, who was one of Louis Riel's last officers, and he was the last Ben Shaw and Batosh. So you always find somebody that you're related to, or you know somebody, or, or whatever. So. So Yes, anybody can attend. Everybody is welcome. It's kind of like um, the Sotoku Toki Friendship Society. Um, anyone can go. Anybody can go and be a member. Uh, you don't have to be indigenous. You don't have to. Um, you don't have a card or anything. You can just go there and uh, enjoy and learn. You know, the greatest thing for me is trying to learn something every day, you know, and um, so to me that's great and I, and I love doing that and I love to, to go to as many things as I can so that I can learn more, you know, and I think that's how we keep going is if we learn something every day, even if it's a little thing, you know, a different way to cook a potato or you know, a new flower to grow, or, uh, you know, but it's always interesting to learn something new every day. But I thank you all very much, and I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So that's just one question. Are you familiar with the book Are you familiar with the book Fair Country? A Fair Country? Is a Fair Country? Yeah. Fair Country. It's familiar. It's written by the husband of That's like, you know, I went to a conference in Edmonton you know, a few years ago now, but there were people there from all over the world, from the United Nations, there are uh, professors from McGill and all of these places. And there was one fellow behind, sitting behind me, and his name is Dr. Peter Baker. And he's from the Netherlands. And yet he's the world's foremost authority on the Mitchell language. 
and it was just it was so interesting to talk to him, you know, because uh, you know it was unusual to have uh, to meet someone from the Netherlands that would be an authority on the Michif language, but but it was true. It was very interesting. So like you you never know when you're going to learn something. Thanks again.